And good morning, uh, Colin, if you're online. Hard to say. I'm, uh, ah, here comes Simona looking for Sophie as, uh, there she is, just to make sure the support system is available. Excellent. Um, welcome. So we are here for the next track one session. Uh, this is a good one, uh, unlike those other ones. <laughs> um, so we've, we've called it uh, Sustainable Poverty Escapes Graduation and Migration, uh, which kind of covers most of what the speakers will share, uh, but not everything. Um, just to get us started, a, a quick word, you know, I, I've had colleagues in RFS even, uh, in my bureau say, oh, now what's re resilience again? That's basically, uh, you know, just trying to help people maintain. Um, you know, it's about survival, right? And, uh, well, no, um, we want everyone that we're working with and for to make progress. Uh, resilience is a, essentially a recognition of risk. And in that uh, development uh, trend that we hope for, for, for everyone, um, the resilience would be the capacities to deal with uh, the shocks and stresses uh, uh, that obviously occur. Uh, this is um, uh, just the simple basics. Um, so in a traditional development program, you know, we, we say we want people to go from here to here. Uh, income increased, uh, nutrition improved, etc. cetera. Um, in, a, in a context of um, high risk, uh, those advances um, uh, can be lost in a day, right? So it's not just about making progress, it's making progress that endures. And uh, so we are gonna start with a uh, mini session uh, called, or, or uh, based on the sustainable poverty escapes uh, that the uh, Chronic Poverty Advisory Network uh, with colleagues here have been researching for a long time. Uh, we've seen their uh, products of their research in earlier years. Uh, they're here today uh, to uh, give us some updates, uh, particularly in the uh, uh, aftermath of, of the recent uh, crises, COVID and otherwise. Um, in this kind of long session uh, that we have before us, they're gonna take the first chunk. Uh, we're then going to uh, look a little bit closer at kind of the graduation model, um, which is sometimes referred to as economic inclusion, uh, a bit of theory and then uh, very much uh, the field practice and how that's been working and the learning that's come out of that. And uh, uh, then we're gonna conclude uh, with some uh, more interactive uh, fun time in the other room, uh, three small groups uh, for some quick presentations, then more discussion and Q&A around some of the elements that um, uh, of uh, successful uh, graduation to, to uh, our to resilience that we don't always focus on in our world of agriculture and productivity, et cetera. And these are um, productive migration, uh, psychosocial well-being, and the importance of uh, social capital and social networks. And then uh, we'll in conclude with some uh, remarks by um, some people who are supposed to be here, but I'm not seeing. Um, so <laughs> while we're presenting, uh, we'll try to hunt them down. So, uh, yes, love on. And Sarah, is there a Sarah in the house? Uh, there is no Sarah in the house. So let me um, introduce uh, the first set of speakers. Uh, Andrew Shepard, 
uh, from IDS, uh, Joseph Simbaya from the Institute of Economic and Social Research at the University of Zambia, and Dr. Nompilo Ndlovu uh, from the University of Cape Town uh, right here. If you would um, come up to the stage. And uh, I've asked uh, Sophie actually to keep time. I think we've dedicated uh, about 40 minutes uh, to this portion and uh, um, you've divided it up amongst yourselves and we'll have to um, kind of keep track of that. But uh, we'll start out with uh, Andrew, uh, please. Thank you very much, John, and uh, thank you very much for uh, having us here um, in such strong force. Uh, the brief for this session was to give an overview of our recent work since the last Resilience Forum. At, at that forum, we, some of you may remember that we presented our work on sustained escapes from poverty, uh, some of which USAID had supported financially, uh, quite, a, quite a significant chunk, um, as that involved what, understanding what helped ha achieve household resilience. Um, if you have a look at the Chronic Poverty website, um, you will find a stream of work on poverty dynamics and all that work on sustained escapes is, is there. Uh, sadly, much more of the recent work has focused on the pandemic as it became a major source of loss of resilience and impoverishment. And we're just about to publish a chronic poverty report on pandemic poverty. So the last chronic poverty report we produced was on growth, partly based on the, the work on sustained escapes this one on pandemic poverty. And what I'm gonna do uh, in my piece at the beginning here is to really go through the main themes in that, in that report. But just before I do that, um, a little comment uh, about resilience outcomes. I've mentioned sustained escapes and I've mentioned impoverishment. Resilience outcomes could be the ratio between sustained escapes and impoverishment. Uh, if you've got a good ratio, uh, you're getting resilient households. If you've got a, a poor ratio, you're not getting resilient households. We were talking about this, I think Greg was putting a challenge to us, but that could be one potential outcome measure which brings together all the silos that we, that we all come from. Um, so at the same time as writing the chronic, developing the chronic poverty report on pandemic poverty, we've also continued doing our standard country level analyses of poverty dynamics and drawing the policy implications and then engaging with policymakers. And this is reflected um, in the presentations on Zambia and Zimbabwe. During the pandemic also, this was complemented by uh, going back to um, uh, interviewees that we had interviewed before the pandemic uh, and seeing how they were doing during the pandemic and producing for about, in about 10 countries uh, bulletins which were attempts to get information out in real time so ideally a bulletin would come out a month or a couple of months after um, uh, after I should be using this clicker shouldn't I you were wondering yeah there we go I'm gonna have to catch up there we go <laughs> um, yeah so uh, that was an attempt to um, to provide information to policymakers in, in real time. Now, I realize that this is the after lunch session and you've all had a good lunch. I've had a good lunch too. Um, and I guess I, I'm hoping that the uh, life stories that we're going to share uh, along the way in our presentation will be one way of helping you to stay awake. Um, if I stop clicking, just remind me, will you? <laughs> So this, this report's been a team effort, a very large team across uh, eight or nine countries. Um, so much resilience, as you can all imagine, were painstakingly gained pre-pandemic was lost during these years, indicating how fragile progress has been. I would say that during the pandemic, it seemed that guarding resilience has not really made it into the policy mainstream in low and middle income countries, <laughs> judging by the, the scarcity of the discourse around it, or indeed the scarcity of the discourse around poverty. In years to come, maybe a challenge is for the resilience community to get its message across much better. 
Uh, and one of the one of aspects of that message is to build resilience at individual household and community level, supported by adequate systems, which will back it. And this is what we've all been talking about. Was it that we also panicked along with the policymakers and didn't know enough about resilience to predict what would happen with the measures being proposed? Or was it that our channels to express these apprehensions were suddenly removed as we were unable to interact except virtually? In any case, resilience capacities were widely undermined as restrictions were put in place to contain the spread of the virus and prevent health systems being overwhelmed. Can you actually see that diagram? Yeah? Yes. Can you, you can read it? No. no. Okay. So I won't, I'm not, I'm not going to, I mean, this just illustrates how res, the resilience of one family, which you can see was on an upward trajectory until the COVID period came, uh, was really brought down by COVID. Um, what I will do is, as I go, as I go through, I will uh, hopefully remember to um, talk you through the, the life histories as they come up. I won't talk you through that one. Um, the sources of impoverishment, we've mentioned many of them, um, the restrictions which uh, undermined economic activities, the job losses, the reduced, it wasn't just job losses, it was reduced hours and reduced days of work in many cases, as was mentioned yesterday in the case of Bangladesh. Um, low income uh, informal economies, um, there was reverse migration, Border closure, something that WHO actually advised against quite explicitly. Um, that this undermines a lot of countries, I mean, particularly in southern Africa, populations live near the borders uh, and the centers of some countries can be a little bit emptier. So border closures were very, very significant. Increased care burdens and, as has been mentioned uh, several times already, gender-based and domestic violence. Sources of resilience. Uh, health investments, countries that had um, invested in health prior to the pandemic, let's say over the five or ten years previously, uh, were, had options, had greater options when the pandemic struck. And the case that I like to refer to here is Nicaragua, which had invested hugely in its uh, regional hospitals and in its community-based care system. Um, and this meant that the government of Nicaragua, when the pandemic struck, could say, well, actually, we're not going to close our economy down. This was a very controversial case um, in many ways, uh, because it was going against uh, many of the, the, much of the guidance coming out of WHO at the time. Um, we're not going to close the economy down. With too many people working in the informal sector, they'll lose their jobs, they'll lose their incomes and so on. We're gonna, we, we don't think that our health services are going to be overwhelmed. We think we have good community level services. We can give people information. They can decide for themselves. They didn't close their schools. Uh, they allowed uh, parents to decide whether their kids went to school or not, and so on. So it was a very different um, approach to managing the, <coughs> managing the pandemic. I think demographic structures, uh, many of the countries in the global south have uh, high youthful populations. And as we began to discover a few months into the pandemic, um, the virus affected um, those people uh, much less than older people. Um, so there were um, these sources, the open air economies perhaps. Agriculture was a source of resilience if the, if the markets were allowed to continue to function. Uh, and some governments made um, you know, very explicit steps for that. We've talked about diversification, we've talked about social capital, but in our observations, social capital was pretty exhausted for many people at the bottom of the distribution by 2021. So 2020, they'd, they'd uh, used whatever social capital they had. And likewise, we've talked about social protection um, uh, and that also that, you know, some of the measures stopped. Um. So our research found examples of resilience and coping strategies, which did lead to positive results, uh, even during the pandemic. Though where people were left to their own devices, uh, strategies soon ran out. But there were some in the middle there, like village savings and loan associations. Um, uh, and uh, I've already mentioned the inclusive market systems and social protection. Um, but the households uh, who um, you know, had to borrow, go into debt, um, sometimes had to sell assets, particularly when they couldn't repay their 
loans. Uh, they used up all their savings. They didn't have any further savings and so on. There were some quite <laughs> negative uh, coping strategies in those uh, circumstances, some of which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, I, I mean, I would say that, you know, that, that fundamentally the major policy responses were impoverishing and they weren't adequately compensated by mitigating measures. So some of the lessons here, um, differences in context need to be considered in pandemic policy response and I've mentioned some of those differences. We need to have a balance between the public health uh, restrictions in any future pandemic with resilience considerations, with considerations for social and economic progress. One of the key things that we found in our key informant interviews across uh, the eight countries that, we, that our co-authors came from uh, was the question of who decides about the balance, who decides about you know, whether um, the health restrictions are going to be the main response or whether they're going to be balanced with some other responses. And there were countries with, um, with quite sort of comprehensive decision-making structures, uh, of which Cambodia was, was one, where um, there were many people in the room making the decision. And it seemed as though you would get a more balanced decision about uh, these issues if you had more people in the room, where you had a narrow spectrum of people in, in the room, maybe a president, President's office, Prime Minister's office, and the Ministry of Health, then you might get a very narrow response. And I think the other, the other lesson is that uh, we need to have a stronger set of resilience maintaining measures um, for these. I think we've already heard about the social protection response there. Um, so I think I've probably mentioned, the, 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 this is on the right hand side is basically the contents of uh, the list of contents of the report. Uh, so the report looks at social protection. I'm not going to do too much of that today. It looks at economic policies. Uh, the report is, is very much um, an attempt to analyze the policy responses and evaluate the policy responses. Uh, it looks at education and it looks at the issue of tackling multiple crises. Uh, clearly in many situations, COVID was not the only or even the main crisis. Oh gosh, really? Okay, um, so I'm going to be very quick. I, I'm just going to think that you can't read that either. Uh, anyway, um, on, in terms of economic responses, um, most countries worked very much on macro responses rather than micro responses. Um, and there was quite a lot of f fiscal uh, stimulus, but a lot of it went to the big players. For example, in Bangladesh, it went to the garments industry. Uh, and possibly 20% of the, the fiscal stimulus went to um, the kind of measures that might uh, make a difference to uh, poor people in Bangladesh. The informal economies were, were very much uh, damaged uh, and they weren't reached in general by uh, either the economic measures or in many cases the um, social protection measures. And I'm going to now rush through a little bit because I've been told that, yeah, I'm going to come to education. Um, this is woven through many stories that we collected, as uh, in the case of Mercy here. Um, the pandemic-induced school closures affected the education outcomes of youth, but also the businesses of their carers. And Mercy was able to slightly recover through diversifying her household income, but she was still, um, she had quite a, a problem in the, in the pandemic. Key informants said things like, this, uh, this was in Zambia. The closure of schools was not necessary because infection rates among pupils were very low. The government should not have closed all the schools given that restaurants and pubs remained open, seeing that it's very difficult to contain such places. And a comment from India. The lack of decentralized decision-making was the reason for long school closures. For example, they should have said, let the school community and their parents decide when this particular school should open. But we have no such mechanism for decision-making even at the block level in India. And like the, inform like the informal economy, schools were to some extent treated as dispensable. They seem to have little political clout, uh, perhaps because they're catering to children, uh, and in some cases because teachers were privately engaged, providing tuition, so even the teachers weren't. Um, there were countries like Nicaragua where, um, uh, 
you know, where the, where the schools didn't close. As I mentioned, there were a few others. Um, the major alternative education was digital, of course, but where connectivity problems were significant, digi digital education didn't work, and teachers needed professional development to think through and implement all these alternatives. Uh, and alternatives like small study group learning, which was tried in, in Cambodia, among other countries. Uh, and this just shows uh, some of the elements of blended, what they call blended learning in Cambodia. So this was the blending of digital and small group uh, learning. And they took this very seriously. However, access to the digital part was still a limitation for many children and significant uh, periods of learning were nevertheless lost. Um, sometimes I'm, I'm talking about state failure here and, and the state was failing to, uh, to really maintain the resilience of its citizens in many situations. And sometimes communities took up some of the slack. So this in Ethiopia where, where there's very impressive community response in the absence of government, which was through most of the pandemic engaged in fighting wars. We organized a resource mobilization to support the poor students. The program is called One Kilogram. One student was asked to bring one kilo of grain. It could be teff, maize, sorghum, or wheat. Then we sold the grain. We used the money to buy a uniform, pen, a pencil, exercise books for 64 students from the poorest families, <coughs> with the remaining money and some contributions from teachers. We bought two chickens for each one of the 38 poorest children and so on and so forth. So, I mean, there were, there were lots. Ethiopia was the case where there was a, a lot of initiatives like that. Um, and as widely recognized, we're in an era of multiple crises. Wars and insecurity persist. Climate change and climate extremes are pervasive. And here we have um, Hassan, whose economic difficulties and restricted access to his regular means of coping, such as through migration or access to health services, this is in Afghanistan, uh, caused his well-being to deteriorate over time. And of course, in Afghanistan, there was very little... Um, social protection available to stabilize that situation. I'm sorry those diagrams haven't been uh, very effective. Um, and this chart just shows uh, on the, in the top right hand quadrant um, uh, countries where um, during COVID there was uh, also conflict um, and other disasters and it just shows you the uh, the overlaps, which are particularly in low-income countries. Um, so this is the context for the, the sort of multiple crises. And approaches to dealing with multiple crises, we, we looked around for, for, for ways in which the international community or uh, anyone really had, had done this. And we found the humanitarian development peace nexus um, and integrating conflict into disaster risk reduction strategies and agencies work. Um, so, with the humanitarian uh, peace nexus, development peace nexus, um, we had the example from the Afghanistan humanitarian needs overview, which did those things that you can see on the, uh, the left-hand side, and integrating, um, uh, in, integrating conflict into disaster risk management uh, strategies. In fact, we had an example of where COVID was integrated into disaster risk management strategies in Cyclone Amphan on the right-hand side. So there were, there were some attempts there. Um, I'm going to leave, I think I'm done with time, John. So uh, I'm going to leave out the, this bit on social protection because it, it covers much of what was done yesterday and uh, ask Joseph to come up and talk about Zambia. All right, so I'll talk about um, Zambia. Um, okay, let me start from here. So these findings, uh, I think, uh, span a period of time. Uh, 2014, particularly, to 2015 was a study, and then later on we picked up from 2019 to now. So what you have here is... Um, what one would consider very important if we were to eradicate uh, extreme poverty. So 
you are basically looking at uh, three critical objectives that should be made. One that aims to tackle uh, chronic poverty, stop impoverishment, and then build sustained escapes. Now for Zambia, um, we have very high uh, uh, chronic poverty, and this goes way back to before the pandemic. So um, we have a mix of uh, chronic poor, um, sustained escapers, uh, transitory escapers, and this was way before. So what the pandemic did was to come and add to the crisis and um, result in impoverishment. So a bit of um, a history. So prior to the pandemic, and if you looked at the period, um, the first period we should look at maybe from 2011 onwards, Zambia was characterized by systemic stressors that uh, was driving the declines in income, savings, and assets, and as a result, increasing people's vulnerability. Now, the more recent period from 2017, um, to around 2020-2021 was characterized by a lot of shocks. Um, we have had armyworms affecting farmers uh, greatly. You can hardly grow maize or any crop without um, using these chemicals to kill worms. Uh, we uh, suffered some fires in many markets, which again uh, plunged people into poverty and then the electricity problem, load shedding, where people could barely trade uh, in markets because they were sometimes receiving one hour of electricity in a day. And if you're running a barber shop, then you can't do anything. So we had that, and then floods, droughts have also characterized the recent past, including a cholera outbreak, and then came in the COVID-19, um, later also chemical attacks, gassing. So all these uh, worked together to present very serious shocks that made it very difficult for, for families. So just uh, trying to characterize um, sustained escapers, transitory escapers, and chronic poor. What our studies found was that for sustained escapers, usually these had stable childhoods, um, and of course hard work was an ingredient, but also they had diversified sources of income. Interestingly also, those who were married and had stable marriages were more likely to sustain their escapes from poverty. But also, of course, that also came with respectful relations within families. Um, there was absence of alcohol abuse and other drug abuse, and often their children um, went to school. Whereas for transitory escapers, yeah, a bit of these elements were present, but uh, then they, were, they would be fluctuating well-being. So they were more vulnerable to shocks compared to sustained escapers. For the chronically poor, uh, mainly these would be in rural areas and um, characterized by early marriages. We found people who, women who had gone into marriage as young as 14 years, and now they were in their 80s, and along the way, Basically, they have just been poor. Uh, Female-headed households, but also these were households uh, for those who were married. There was a lot of gender-based violence, and um, yeah, child labor was a characteristic. And illness, as well as loss of the a loved one, it could be the, 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 the household head. All those factors work together to um, leave them in chronic poverty. So what are the drivers of um, uh, escape, poverty escape? Um, 
Well, I've just spoken to some of these personal ones, but uh, in addition, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, former employment, and for those who had assets, this helped when they needed them. But social protection also, um, and we saw this especially during the pandemic where they increased their location, the transfer value was increased, and there was some regularity in dispensing these funds. So these were uh, factors that helped, even though for social protection, well, it helped families stabilize, but at a relatively low level. It wouldn't really help them to escape because of the dosage and many other factors. In terms of impoverishment beyond uh, personal, of course, issues of poor health, uh, failure to access um, social cash transfer, and um, environmental depression as well. We saw in uh, farm fishing communities where basically there are no fishes and so forth. So a number of these came together. But also gender-based issues, divorces and so forth also drove people into poverty. So these are the concerns for the poor. Basically in terms of um, Economic concerns is more around loss of livelihoods, increased costs of living, and Zambia has continuously been experiencing very high inflation, uh, capital depletion, and so forth. For social, and we saw this mainly during the pandemic, the breakdown of support system due to limited social cohesion, and uh, education closures also had their own challenges because schools were closed for a long time children or young ones ended up uh, getting pregnant, others going to child labor and so forth. And so all these sort of plunged people into poverty. And for health as well, uh, limited access to health services. And um, yeah, we also had the challenge, which I believe was in most countries in Africa, uh, lack of trust in vaccines. So it took a while for people to really start queuing up and getting their, their doses. Oh, great, I'll be, I'll try to run. Um, yeah, so this is just an illustration of uh, among, we, so we followed a cohort of um, around 28 uh, families um, over this period from around uh, March 2020 to December 2021, just to try and see what was happening to people's livelihood. And what you see there at the start is when the first case was recorded of COVID-19. And so generally as a group, we see their well-being going down. And um, then when going further down and then recording some improvements later. Okay, so in terms of uh, pandemic uh, impoverishment, the most affected people, of course, girls and women, children and youth, and protected workers there. And uh, the sectors, tourism was one that was hardly hit, the transport sector, care economy as well, and so forth. Okay. Yeah, this, this slide's just an illustration of the public health measures that Andrew talked about on the one hand, the adverse effect they had and what the government and NGOs tried to mitigate the impact. And um, yeah, the education sector, health, social protection. We had a bit of um, cash, more cash transfers in including emergency cash transfer, that sort of helped. But in terms of education, I think we didn't manage because of connectivity issues. So very few children were able to learn. Um, this is my last slide. Um, of course, speaking to uh, the pandemic and the policy implications, so what our study recommends uh, from all these issues, current depreciation, um, 
of the currency, climate change, uh, army worms, debt crisis, and so forth, uh, that, um, yeah, we put in measures to, ad to address inflation, registration and better targeting of social protection, investing in making food systems more si uh, resilient, among others, including increased political will and funding for social health protection for sustainable coverage um, of, of uh, the sector. I will end here. Afternoon, everyone. Okay, fine. Just wanted to check. Okay, it works. Okay, good. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nompi Londlovu, and I recently was part of the um, CPAN research that was conducted in Zimbabwe. Um, I think we did our field work over the December, January period, 2022, and much of the work later in the year. Um, so it was very good to be back home and on the ground because it's one thing as a theorist to write a lot about your country. It's another thing to physically be walking in the rural spaces and kind of seeing the lived um, reality. Um, so um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the context. Um, so they took the, the idea to reach, it's impossible to reach the whole of Zimbabwe. I mean, at this, so what we just tried to do was kind of work from a Zimbabwe Pisces study. The last one at that time had been done in 2017. I think the 2021 one just literally came out now, 2022, after the study was done. So we had to use that, that study. And it basically, what was done is that we tried to pick two communities, definitely not districts, so maybe wards in districts, very small communities, um, that had either had a downward trajectory, so that means that they had actually moved towards chronic pro poverty and their trajectory was getting worse, um, or else we also took two communities that were moving towards an upward trajectory, like where you could see that there's upward mobility um, and there's differences. So we had one urban, one urban upward mobility, one urban downward and one rural upward mobility and one rural downward. So just to kind of throw this out there, um, Zim generally has a population of about 16 million. So Zim is 67% rural. So that also really matters, right, to say, hey, it's, it's quite, I mean, when you're trying to do policy for urban spaces and rural, they are quite dynamically different places. Um, in the same way that these sites that we ended up with are not necessarily homogenous. Um, they kind of don't speak of one kind of person, but they try to show you the different kinds of poverty dynamics that can exist. So um, one of the districts, Manenga, was in Bindura, which is a rural area. It's on a downward trajectory, um, and they largely subs um, survive of subsistence farming. The other one was in Cholocho, so Bindura Rural. Yeah, okay, so that's the downward trajectory. Cholocho is an upward trajectory. I think it falls under the Matebele Land um, province in Zimbabwe. Um, and basically, um, they survive of subsistence farming. Uh, okay, I'll explain it later. Casual labor remittances. Chitungwiza, um, is on a downward trajectory, mostly formal and informal employment, um, and Wulawayo. These are just basic overviews, right, of the of the places where they are, but I can go into a little bit more detail. Um, Manenga is in geographical ecological region too. So it generally means that um, farming initiatives are generally what sustain these people, right? Um, so the idea is to say how then amidst such thriving subsistence farming and small livestock rearing are people continually falling into a downward trajectory? How then are they becoming chron chronically poor when they have like good land and, and ideally good water? Um, a lot of these people were beneficiaries of Fumvudza, which is a, a, a government uh, conservative farming scheme. I mean, it's just better suited to the land. Um, a lot of them did casual labor. Um, 
there was an uptake of artisanal mining in the area, which a lot of the youth were doing. So this was another thing that the people in, in Manenga were complaining about, um, to say that they actually have large tracts of communal or reserved la land, but the youth are just, the uptake of agricultural farming for youth is actually not a thing. And yet youth actually are becoming the larger portion of demography. So a lot more of them will opt to actually go into artisanal mining, mining because of the fact that it will give more money. Um, it, well, at least they think if they find gold or something, they'll literally strike gold. That's what they're trying to do. Um, and then the, the people who were then left in the rural spaces, um, Bindura Manenga being one of them, you found were dependents. It was school going children to the age of 18, or else it was retired people who may have had an urban life before, but when they retire, they actually retire to the rural areas because they say that the standard of living is actually cheaper. So actually a way to sustain everything is to retire and move to the rural um, sites and ideally rent out your home in the urban area or something. So they felt that the tracts of land were difficult to plow because it's like it's huge communal land and the, the students, the learners at school by day um, and then they, they are like a little bit elderly and they're not able to, to farm the land. So it's not that they're not necessarily getting seeds. You can see they're beneficiaries of like the presidential input scheme and stuff, but the, the land is, is quite overwhelming for them. Um, but also in this time, COVID, of course, was, was the big issue for all of these sites. I want to say that up front. But also in this time, um, then they started also just having a lot of like livestock. Um, so there was January disease. Um, it, a, a, a tick-borne disease that basically affects livestock. So by the time we researched Bindura, not a single family had a single cattle left. They had all actually been destroyed in one clean soup. So then they were saying it's actually difficult because we use our livestock to we use our livestock for plowing, and then once your livestock is depleted, then you don't even have that asset. To, you can't sell, you can't do anything with it, it's gone, and yet you don't have the labor anymore. Um, so, so what was also happening then was a lot of people were selling themselves as casual labor. So they would go to fellow farmers and say, I can come and f farm your land. Um, but that means they are food insecure at that time. Um, there's a lot of climate change issues going on here. Um, the land is actually quite depleted. So then it's this whole point that they continue to do agricultural ventures on land that they're also depleting. Um, and then again, the youth come into this again. There's distress migration. So we initially they moved to Harare, which is... Uh, well, one of the largest cities next to them, and eventually they, they move to neighboring countries. So it's a cash poor community. Generally, money doesn't revolve around, doesn't move around. Like people do barter, they'll train, trade like chickens for other things. And that also has an interesting aspect because when you're trying to, and I think it contributes towards their downward spiral towards chronic poverty, the lack of money moving in the community means that you also struggle to, to do or invest or, or get into other ventures. Um, Chitungwiza, and let me try to run through this. I don't run out of time. Chitungwiza is a dormitory city to Harare, um, and as you will see, uh, the population there on the first um, page, it will say there's 7,279 people per um, square kilometer in Chitungwiza. So you can see that it's already quite dense, it's overpopulated. Um, and it was actually built so that it could provide uh, homes for labor in the capital city, but it's become quite large. There were service delivery challenges, especially access to clean water. Um, and so you found, and this, is, this area is in a downward trajectory, people even to survive the young girls, especially during COVID, when they were not going to school, were trying to make money for the family, carrying water um, from house to house, borehole water, which they were selling. But they would say sometimes you carry like, like 40 liters a day for like the equivalent of one US dollar, right? But that, so then they're trying to generate money out of their bodies, but it comes with a, a different risk. It's, it's too much, right? Carrying, and then the money that they get out of it is barely enough to, they'll tell you that they make a dollar a day out of that and you're like, okay, that's, um, and the barons in Chitungwiza who were making more money were generally higher end people who actually would bring in trucks and they would deliver water from house to house. Um, but there's a lot of vending and petty trading. The problem with Chitungwiza was that literally every second household, when you sit outside, when you walk past the gate, everybody's selling the same thing. They're all selling vegetables. They're all literally selling the exact same things, masks. So they actually don't make profit because they are, they've been told to be entrepreneurial, but they're all literally doing the same thing. Um, urban gardening wasn't as prominent in Chitungwiza, a little, especially when you get access to municipal land. Um, but 
again, it's the same vegetables that are in every household. And they also said, as much as this is healthy, try eating these same green vegetables every day of your life. Um, there's no diversity, there's no meat. So it's not like you're poor because you, you're sleeping hungry, but it's just you're not having a diversity in the kind of food that you're eating. Um, so a lot of sex work, there was an uptake of sex work, particularly during COVID. I'd like to tie this in more to what Andrew had said, to say a lot of the young school-going um, uh, children were actually not at school and so what they were actually doing was they were going to be used for transactional sexual but literally like for like a dollar uh, thing and sometimes when they were like young like the age of 12 or 13 they didn't even know how to negotiate those dynamics so they would actually come home and they would say they got two lollipops or like a packet of chips or something um, but just the lack of understanding to say even that activity as dangerous as it is is actually just it just does more harm than anything because the health related issues and the community in St. Mary's complained about the number of young people they were bearing due to um, HIV um, and AIDS related um, over time and it was becoming a serious concern for them. Some of the guys have saving clubs, um, but of course the currency, the economy has tanked, so that always impacts as well. And a lot of them survived of their spora remittances. Um, Cholocho Rural, oh wow, really? Oh, okay, okay, I didn't mean to be shocked. But Cholocho Rural is very interesting because they're on an upward trajectory and they actually, are on an upward trajectory, not because of agricultural activities, yet they are in a communal land. It's too dry, they're an ecological region um, four. So they barely get like 650 milliliters of water the whole year, um, and it's so erratic. So the reason Cholocho survives is actually because of its proximity to South Africa. So what will happen in Cholocho is that you will find that a lot of the youth they have actually never physically been in Wulawayo, a city which is an hour's drive away, but they have been in and out of South Africa, which is about five or six hours drive. Um, so in and out, their parents would send for them during school holidays and stuff. So a lot of them, and we learned in this particular community we were in, it's not to say Cholocho only has four schools, but in the community we're in, they had four primary schools to one high school. So by the time people turned 13, the high school couldn't absorb anyone, everyone. So by the time they were 13, then they're already migrating to South Africa as casual labor, mostly in restaurants, um, in um, agriculture, gardening work, um, domestic workers, and stuff like that. And they had basically sustained their families back in Cholocho until COVID hit. So when COVID hit, then this upward trajectory, I imagine would have been disturbed quite greatly because they were low wage workers and they were the ones who lost their jobs. And they were also largely res residing in South Africa illegally without paperwork because you cross over and you just speak the same language um, and, and stuff like that. So the interesting thing about Cholocho is that it's a multi-currency system. You very rarely see the Zim bond in circulation. You won't even see the Zim US dollar that people use. You'll likely see like Rands, um, Botswana Pula, um, butter trade, cattle, and stuff like that. But it really just, it sustains, it's upward trajectories that it sustains on its own outside of just generally. You, when you look at it, you feel like you're in a piece of South Africa, which is quite interesting. Um, and lastly, let me just get through Nketa and then I'll just run through one or two points in the next slide. Um, it was built for blue collar labor. They also survive and cross border trading again, proximity to South Africa and Botswana. Botswana is one hour away from Bulawayo. South Africa is about four hours drive. Vending, um, community gardens, um, beer brewing, a lot of like beer brewing, especially during COVID, people were just like, hey, we might as well, you know, drink it out. I mean, right. Um, casual labor um, and stuff. So um, I'm just going to run through a few points, if it's okay, just to finish off. Um, there's a lot of structural and institutional violence. The economy, people try to save, kind of get themselves out of poverty. The economy tanks, your money's in the bank, the currency changes, then it kind of ruins things for you. It's natural and human-made disasters, so the climate change is an issue. I've already spoken into some of the spatial realities, so I'm not going to go into that. Gendered realities, the households that generally have multiple spouses and children just tend to, to be in a downward trajectory when you follow their life histories then they'll usually say okay you know he he had me and he left me and then he married somebody else and by the time we're done there were five children there were five wives and there were 22 children and these children got a better privilege than others so just those multiple settings change everything another thing that was bringing um, a downward trajectory in the rural areas was inheritance norms around assets so in Zimbabwe you're not allowed now to take away the land from a widow if her husband is deceased but 
whilst it's stated in policy, you will find that the community will still come and snatch away that land. They'll say he's gone now. So this, we're taking back this land. It, it, it follows a patrilinear line. So we can't leave it with you. So um, multiple spouses and children, I imagine, was people in the rural areas generally had larger families, 13, 14, for plowing purposes, the land, the labor. But in the urban areas, if you have 13 children and then you have a shock, then obviously you're screwed because you're quite many. There's intergenerational considerations. There's also exclusions um, and being on the margins. In the urban areas and the rural areas, they wouldn't even totally mention the LGBTQIs. They say they don't exist. We don't want to talk about it. You don't get to ask those questions. But in the urban areas, then they said, you know what, they're there. But the truth is that we won't support their businesses. So in our community in St. Mary's, there's a lesbian and she, she sells um, batiks, woodwork and stuff. We actually deliberately don't buy her stuff. Um, so that's also a way to kind of fall into poverty, to kind of be on the margins. Um, linguistic minorities, you will have people there who are like Malawians, um, second generation Malawians who've lived in Zimbabwe all their lives, but because they are children of Malawian descendants, whenever aid or food aid comes in, they'll be left out because they'll say you're actually not Zimbabwean. Um, you're originally Zambian or Malawian. Um, and remote communities like the Amasili who are in Cholocho, they speak a different language, they live next to the wildlife, and they, um, they live next to the animals. They stay fighting with the wild animals and no real aid or protection is going to them because those places are dangerous, they're hard to get to, but yet they're the ones that need it the most. They also speak a language which is inaccessible outside of English, Ndebele Shona. Um, let me skip that, but let me say, um, yeah, I think I've covered everything kind of quickly, but they do say that those who are generally non-resilient um, are widowed, single mothers, pensioners, it's the fastest way to kind of, because of the economy, like your, your spouse passes away, then you can't, in, in, in stress, you, don't, you don't cope. The youth are engaging in asymmetrical relationships, substance abuse. There's so much financial loss going on right now in pyramid and Ponzi schemes, like the, the need to actually be like investing in something that gives money back. And these schemes are always in the urban areas and amongst the low income communities and then they just disappear. And the rest are health related issues like mental health, high blood pressure, which has to do with the stress and just, yeah, just the, the lifestyle and how they are coping. I kind of jumped through some stuff, but I hope you get the, the gist of it. Thank you. Um, is this on? Awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I think we realize that uh, there's a, a huge uh, depth of research that was done here that we barely scratched the surface and not really fair to our presenters to have them race through what was uh, a much, much longer study. But they did share uh, links to websites uh, where this um, data and inf information all lives. And we are going to take... Um, from these uh, quick glances into uh, what they've studied and learned. We're gonna take a few minutes to see about uh, questions um, from the audience and just maybe something that stood out to you that you'd like to pursue um, just a little bit more. Uh, who would um, like to uh, ask a question? Here we go, right up front. Thanks very much for those very uh, brief but deep uh, snapshots into lives during COVID. Um, my question might be obvious because of what I've been speaking about the last couple of days, but I was curious in, in some of the things that you were looking for, I think it was mentioned a bit more in the Zimbabwe case, um, but just the role of kind of nature and natural assets or natural capital or however it's phrased as a source of resilience or as a, a, a something that could buffer people from certain shocks. And I wondered whether that was, I didn't see it so much in the first presentation, a little bit more in the second, strong, stronger in the third. But I wondered, was that because you didn't ask questions about it or it just didn't come out as a strong feature of how people were maybe being more reliant on, on natural systems for food security um, and health measures? Um, yeah, it just didn't come out. Uh, from what people were saying, or it's because you didn't ask about it. Um, I think uh, I tried to point out in my short presentation that uh, where uh, 
um, uh, natural resource-based occupations had been protected, allowed to continue, not restricted, that was very much a source of resilience. Um, I remember in Bangladesh, for example, um, the local authorities in a mango growing district put on a special train to connect um, the mango growing district with uh, Dhaka so that that market could be assured. So I think, uh, and I think there are many examples where that kind of protection uh, of markets was, was afforded. Um, and that was certainly a source of, of resilience and survival resilience um, during the pandemic. Um, I mean, I suppose that in uh, more remote uh, rural areas uh, where people are depending on agriculture and forestry and, and uh, fisheries and so on, uh, it may be that the disruptions to those markets were not as severe as in less remote areas. I mean, that's a hypothesis. I'm, not, I'm really not sure whether that uh, was the case. Um, one or two governments went to considerable lengths to protect rural areas in general. And here I'm thinking of Rwanda, uh, which made very strong efforts to contain COVID-19 uh, in Kigali uh, when cases started emerging. Um, and that was largely successful. So as far as I'm aware, the rural um, provinces and, and districts in, uh, in Rwanda were able to continue with normal life to a much greater extent than perhaps in many countries because of the very strong efforts to uh, contain the virus there. Yeah. Perhaps just to quickly add to what he said, in the case studies that we did, COVID and lack of access to the market actually plunged them into further poverty. So even when they had a lot of market produce from their gardens in, the, in, in Bindura, they couldn't access the markets in Domboshawa or Harare. So they were actually watching produce because of the restrictions. So that was the opposite. They literally couldn't sell their stuff even when the land had... Had, had produced it for them. Um, and they also struggled as well with never mind just the ability to get seeds from the government and stuff which they do, just the business side of things also keeps them in, in, in transit. When the, by the time they tell you that of the amount of money that big business people and companies come and buy their produce for, they'll tell you that you'll make heaps and heaps and heaps of stuff and they'll take it for a dollar. And then when you get there, you're just like, it's not worth a dollar. Like by the time they sell it that side, they are making like a hundred dollars off this. So, so they say they're even selling chicken to, chickens at less than, um, at less than cost of what is taken to feed them because these big businesses actually arrive, they swoop in them, they buy their maize and their bounty at literally nothing and they go. So they also have the produce, they just don't negotiate it enough to make them get out of poverty. Yes, um, it, you know, sometimes there might be a significant difference between people poverty and place poverty. Uh, poverty based on people individual characteristics and poverty based on um, uh, location attributes. Uh, in, in your uh, study, uh, uh, did you see which, in terms of resource of resilience, which interventions that are more uh, uh, in terms of building the household uh, uh, resilience. And, and related to that, um, uh, uh, does resilience of people lead to resilience of locations based on, on, on your studies? I mean, I would say, uh, you know, from the kind of general picture that we uh, developed, the narrative that we developed in the chronic poverty report, uh, which by the way, should be out next week or, or so, um, that um, the, the sort that there were not many interventions which were really bolstering resilience. Social protection was one of the few. And I think we already discussed yesterday the limitations of many of the social protection programs which were put in place. Um, and uh, I would say that the countries which I mean, this is perhaps too much of a generalization, but countries which uh, did not engage so heavily in restrictions were also those where resilience was to some extent protected. And I gave you the example of Nicaragua. 
I think people probably generally came through the pandemic much better in Nicaragua than in many other countries, certainly than in many neighboring countries. And the question could be, well, you know, was that at the expense of greater loss of life? And the answer is, you know, from excess from studies of excess mortality, the answer was not so far as one can see. I mean, it's these things, the data is very tricky. Um, so I think, I think lockdowns and restrictions uh, and so on really need to be reviewed uh, in any sort of future pand pandemic uh, planning. And I think another issue that came up, uh, another intervention, by the way, sorry, uh, intervention rather that came up um, as being very needed was um, considering how financial services would react uh, in a, an emergency like, like this. So in many countries, uh, many people borrowed uh, for consumption. And in many situations, especially where there were restrictions for quite long periods of time, it was very difficult for them to repay that borrowing. And in some cases, they would borrow, another, they would borrow again to repay a first loan. And we found in Cambodia, which was otherwise um, probably the best example of, um, you could say, more positive responses on a number of fronts to the, to the pandemic, um, uh, we found there that uh, even pre-pandemic, um, that kind of borrowing had become endemic, very, very frequent. And this was aggravated in the pandemic. Uh, and so the government encouraged um, lenders, the formal sector lenders, uh, to um, delay loan repayments, which many of, which some of them did, but they didn't offer, they didn't um, stop interest payments. Now, if you compare with the, um, the scheme, the, the government-led scheme in the United States uh, to um, persuade lenders to go easy on borrowers, uh, there, the interest payments were suspended, so the loan was not more expensive at the end of the day. The loan still had to be repaid in the United States, but it was not more expensive at the end of the day. Um, and I think in, in Cambodia, it was more expensive at the end of the day, so many people didn't take up the offer. And I think, this, I think there needs to be a review of, a really strong review of financial services in the context of a, 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 an emergency like this and how they performed. and what would be the solutions to those kind of situations in future. Thanks. I, I'm afraid uh, we are at time. And uh, uh, our friends are here. We have a coffee break in a short while. I know they would be uh, more than happy to uh, chat uh, offline. And uh, I do encourage everyone to visit uh, their websites. Uh, and if we can give a final round of applause for the CPAN team. So thanks. Uh, part two of this uh, three-part session, uh, I'm going to invite Rita up to the stage. And did we succeed in getting Colin online? Awesome. So uh, we're going to hear um, kind of two sides of the same coin. Uh, we're going to hear a bit about uh, economic inclusion and then uh, a bit... Hi, Colin. How are you? Good. Uh, you're going next, by the way. Um, very good. And then a bit about uh, the graduation model and the learning from it uh, that uh, Rita and Afsi uh, will bring to us from Uganda. Um, so Colin Andrews is from the World Bank. Uh, he coordinates the uh, Partnership for Economic Inclusion uh, group, I believe. And uh, he's... Um, standing in for someone who's standing in for someone who's standing in for someone uh, because he's available to give uh, the talk, but he probably knows the content uh, as well or better than uh, all the rest. So very glad to have you, uh, Colin, and please, uh, um, I think you have about uh, 10 minutes. Eh? Thank you. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. We can hear you. Perfect. Um, so I have been at a few um, in-person workshops over the last couple of months, and I find there's nothing more annoying than having 
some random speaker come in halfway on the gigantic screen uh, halfway through, uh, especially late in the afternoon uh, when you all want to get coffee. So I am very sympathetic to you all, uh, and I would have happily yielded time uh, to the previous uh, panelists because I find the report really fascinating. Um, but now that I am here uh, and I have your attention, I suppose for 10 minutes, uh, what I thought I would do is to well, walk you through a few ideas. Um, actually, I think it's a nice segue uh, coming from the, the COVID experiences, the recovery experiences and the thinking around resilience. I wanted to share a few uh, thoughts coming from the Partnership for Economic Inclusion. Uh, we're hosted within the World Bank's Social Protection and Jobs Global Practice, uh, supported by BRAC, uh, as well as uh, Irish Aid, German Development Cooperation and um, uh, Co-Impact. So just to get all of those acknowledgements out of the way. Um, you're all tired, you all need coffee. So I will move briskly through the presentation and give you just a few things to think about uh, without trying to lecture you in any way because I think there's so much expertise already in the room. So three considerations just to uh, feed into uh, the dialogue uh, in, in the course of the day. Uh, we always do these presentations, we're always asked, well, well hang on a second, well, what, what do you mean? What, what, what is economic inclusion programs uh, often used interchangeably with graduation programs or productive economic productive inclusion programs? We define them as a bundle of interventions uh, targeting those at the lower end of the income distribution uh, really to increase incomes and assets. So we're thinking of livelihood programs, uh, safety net plus programs, uh, cash plus programs, etc. And I'm sharing some data here pre-COVID. Uh, and the uh, data here was looking at the coverage of these programs by region, the number of beneficiaries, which had totaled around 90 million uh, beneficiaries. And at that time, we tracked 115 programs. And the lower end of the bar looks at the lead institution. So what's happening here on the government side as well as the non-government side. So a huge range of programs uh, uh, led by both types of institution, but the larger share of coverage coming from under um, government led programs. And I probably should have said at the beginning, uh, this is relevant to the presentation and I hope relevant to your discussions today because within the Partnership for Economic Inclusion, the big mission that we're trying to understand is the potential uh, to move these programs to a scalable level. Uh, and what that means, uh, working through government systems, working in partnership with different organizations, given their costs and given their complexity. The second um, framing consideration is just to talk a little bit about target groups and objectives since this data again comes from our 2021 uh, report uh, and the big takeout from this slide really is just to look at a wide diversity of objectives and a wide diversity of target groups um, but often when you break it down a large share of these programs are looking at drives towards self-employment, uh, boosting household productivity, uh, with a very strong emphasis on uh, the role of uh, women's economic empowerment, as, as well as youth. At the same time, a high degree of customization in different contexts for uh, displacement, uh, something I, I, I think Rita will probably talk about. And then the third question, just to anticipate the Q&A session, or we may not have time for that, is, well, hang on a second, uh, what is scale? Uh, talk to us about scale. So we've been thinking a lot about scale, uh, and in a lot of our work, we try to focus on the programmatic aspects as well as the institutional aspects. When we think about scale, we know that the coverage of programs uh, will be very nascent and will be relatively small. So that's certainly a major part of, 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 of scale, uh, but also thinking around functional expansion. So how these programs might be layered on top of one another um, to do more, um, but also scale in terms of the institutional anchoring of programs. And the slide speaks to that. And I think the idea here is that as we think about these programs coming from different sectors and very different contexts, uh, they take a long time uh, to build uh, and they don't just happen overnight. Hope you're still with me. Um, the second uh, kind of thought bucket that I wanted to put forward was just to share with you a, a couple of ideas on what the current portfolio looks like. Uh, we've been taking a track uh, post COVID uh, within the World Bank and also outside of the World Bank. So the State of Economic Inclusion Report 2024, uh, the data gathering process for that is underway and rather advanced. Um, but what we're seeing, uh, not so much to our surprise, uh, perhaps to our reassurance, I'm presenting data here only from the bank, uh, is a continued surge coming out of the COVID period into a recovery period in the current context of the poly crisis. So within the World Bank alone, uh, we see a high number of 
active and pipeline operations. And I think this number might be slightly overestimated, but it gives you a sense. And what's interesting, um, just from this graph alone, not just because it's like World Bank uh, data at all, um, but this data is gathered from around seven different global practices. So not just the social protection and job side, but the global practices in agriculture, on environment and blue economy, uh, financial uh, finance, competitiveness and innovation. So I think the big point here is to underscore the idea that we're seeing these programs coming from a wide degree of directions. Um, and also they're very much driven uh, from the uh, from the African side as well, but cutting across many different regions. Um, just wanted to highlight, um, given the participants in this room, uh, the nature of some of the social protection and jobs uh, programs and portfolios that we are handling across the board. And I'm not going to read into this slide, uh, but just to show uh, a very uh, uh, strong uh, concentration of the portfolio in the East and Southern Africa region. And while I'm on a roll uh, to share with you some ideas and some complexities, uh, and maybe just to keep you a little bit awake, um, I just threw in the slide <clears throat> uh, a little, uh, for the fun of it, I suppose, um, but to underscore a big question. So often one of the big critiques uh, that we see when we're presenting and working with governments on these programs are, look, I mean, these are not a silver bullet. You cannot design these programs purely in isolation. You've got to think about the broader continuity. And this slide is an effort to map um, program interventions uh, across the productivity and income spectrum. So in the bottom left-hand corner here, uh, you look at the role of economic inclusion programs, typically targeting the poor and the non-poor non and informal sector. And the blue uh, bubble there highlights uh, some of the interventions that are coming into play and what these look like from an enterprise type. Um, but I think the question here, uh, often in dialogue with governments looking to support these programs, the question is where do they fit? We often think about a conveyor belt of different responses and different target groups as you move towards a more formal, uh, formalized set of approach, which would be for the minority of, uh, of people, program interventions look very, very different. So I think there's a, as we get into deep discussions on financing and sustainability of these interventions, I just wanted to throw up this slide, uh, really just to highlight uh, as we're thinking about scale, where some of the conversations uh, are, are leading us to in the design and implementation of some of those programs that we mentioned previously. John, I think I've probably got about five minutes left. Uh, and in the course of those five minutes, I just wanted to uh, highlight uh, and call out some of the big design uh, features. That, um, we are uh, three minutes, perfect. Some of the design features uh, that tend to um, come up in the dialogue. Um, to our surprise, when we tracked a lot of these programs across government, we found that the vast majority of governments were looking at these programs with five or six components. And this is quite a surprise in some of our data collections some years back, we thought the number of components would be, um, would be different. So this is just a slide telling you the types of interventions that come under, often complementing a transfer or a business capital grant with coaching, skills, training, et cetera. Um, this slide gives you a little bit of a visual on the economic components and their sequencing. Uh, often these programs are time bound over 18 months or two years or so, and they come with various um, modalities, often building on life skills training, community groups, etc., cetera, and, and, and moving down the track. I'm not going to dwell on this. If we have Q&A, happy to take Q&A on the effectiveness and the evidence base and the costing of programs. Um, but a short note to say that we are seeing a large degree of evidence. The evidence can be contradictory. And we're seeing strong evidence um, often on the uh, NGO uh, space. So there's a big unmet agenda here in terms of looking at government programs and as they scale and what's happening and how we can cost optimize. So we're seeing that there is a very strong opportunity here to optimize and some of those safety net and social protection interventions, which you've deliberated on over the last couple of days, all leading to a big central question around what, what, what's happening on some of these COVID cash transfer interventions and where do we take them? And then finally, a lot of discussions and institutional arrangements, and uh, we will share this slide deck. Uh, we have shared this slide deck with the organizers and a lot of the information covered here um, is available in the report that I mentioned and some background materials that we can also follow up on. In terms of directions, in the last 30 seconds, John, hopefully you'll allow me uh, a few things that we're thinking of uh, very uh, deeply uh, coming out of the COVID response. 
I just put the four themes on the board there. Uh, the women's economic empowerment theme has been front and center and inherent as part of the design of many of these programs. Thinking more about the climate resilience and green recovery agenda and what that actually means as a lens in program implementation and design in terms of how we handle food systems and uh, green jobs. Um, and finally, urban planning. We've heard a lot more uh, queries recently on the migration and displacement agenda too, uh, particularly on the displacement um, front. Um, so these are just a few high level reflections of um, areas uh, that uh, certainly we're seeing across the portfolio and that we're thinking a little bit more about. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Colin. I, I can assure you nobody fell asleep. And uh, <laughs> uh, it, because of the uh, uh, great information you shared and, and shared so well, I hope you can stick around for a few minutes. We're going to let uh, Rita speak. And then there'll be some questions, I'm sure, both for you and for her. Thanks. All right. Um, good afternoon. Good evening. And um, I'm hoping the slides will come up. If you think I'm going to be talking about uh, special characteristics, if you're wearing blue, then you won't be resilient. If you're wearing yellow, no. <laughs> <laughs> because I think we've been listening to things around uh, systems, um, characteristics, geographical locations, and, and but I'm going to take you to a household, uh, a, a refugee household somewhere in a settlement in Uganda. And um, we will uh, be able to take that journey to understand how exactly families will be able to transition out of poverty and move uh, hopefully hang in there stay there when when you connect it to the conversation on sustainable escapes and and remain resilient so since the slides are, are uh, I, I know that uh, colin helped me quite a bit uh, with uh, describing some of the the, the, the characteristics of uh, graduation type programs because this is an economic inclusion program so it's going to be very easy to, to run through that, and I'm sure John is going to be very relaxed. Okay, starting here. Uh, so graduating to resilience is, is funded by, I need to start from that point, because I think it's a very important part, uh, by USAID through BHA, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. And why I'm saying this particularly fast is because it's important to note that it's a seven-year activity. Seven year, because many times uh, these kinds of programs are two years, one year, and they are quite short. Seven year in the sense that you have a chance to study something and actually scale it. And I think this is important also connecting the conversation we had in the morning about uh, when do you study and how that, that mixture. And while we are at it, please get your pencils because I think there's going to be some using the nudge that Greg was telling us about in the morning. You get your pencil. You might want to write something. Anyway. So the idea is, if you see that uh, picture there, that the settlements in Uganda are structured in such a way that if you're a refugee, you'll just stay very close to, to the Ugandan households. And where you see the red there is where we have the refugee households, while the Ugandan households are just across, around it. And you'll also see that clearly from implementation, you're going to struggle with the Ugandans, while you're going to find it easier with the refugees who are based in one central place. And we target uh, 13,000 uh, families, which is roughly about 80,000, 100,000 people in two different cohorts, uh, implemented by AFSI together with the uh, uh, TRICOLAB and American Institute for Research, with an uh, IPA which is doing an evaluation, especially a costing evaluation. And uh, just moving on, and because Colin uh, helped me to talk about this, a graduation approach can also be called uh, economic inclusion. And so, if you recall, he was saying that it's a bundle of uh, multi-sector activities. And also, it's what, what we would really like to, to emphasize is that it needs to be sequenced, time-bound, it must end. And it should follow a certain layer or another. And uh, we, uh, with BHA, have been able to test this within displacement context, but also with food insecurity, so beyond uh, poverty. 
If you look at that diagram, you'll see that there is a lot of sequencing. So one thing will be layered on top of another, uh, linkages, savings, so the typical type of programs, and you will receive one thing after another uh, as, as, a, as a family. What you'll also see that's a bit different uh, from maybe other sequencing diagrams is that you have a, a good time there at the beginning to do some research uh, which informs the design of your program. So you might have your ideas around how the savings activity should go, but because you have studied a bit uh, at the beginning, you refine before you start the delivery. And then, of course, it uses the theory of change approach. Now, the one thing I will say, taking you to these graphs, is that so part of the thing that uh, the, the evaluator was doing was to understand different modalities, to understand between um, between uh, a typical graduation type program that has, let's say six, seven, uh, Colin was talking about, most of them have six. If you look here, we have seven, with a few of them subdivided. So the, the more expensive ones could be about 1,600 with everything inside, including the asset. The less expensive ones would be about uh, 1,400, and that's what we had, that has group coaching, because the coaching aspect also can become expensive or cheaper. And the least expensive one usually has uh, a version where you don't provide the asset transfer, which usually is the one that the cost drivers for economic inclusion programs are, as Colin said, cash. So if you're giving cash for an asset and it's $300, it's already something. If you're giving cash for uh, consumption support for 12 months, uh, and it's going to be about $300. So we were comparing with the evaluator in the first cohort, these three treatments, and trying to understand which one would be cost effective and which one would we scale. Why I'm telling you about that is that in the end, by the time we finished the first cohort, we understood that the scalable arm that was cost effective was the one with the group coaching. So you receive everything except that you, receive, you have a group coach versus an individual coach. Now this is internal data, and I would like you to focus on the green area. If you look at the green areas, the first cohort looks like that. One thing I would like you to notice that if you're doing an economic inclusion program, the data is important because you're going to track a panel every day, every week, and you need to see what's going on with them. So if we're talking about RMS, I can tell you clearly what they were eating over a period of time, daily. And so when you see these uh, movements towards green, it's exciting because it means people are moving towards uh, uh, graduation. And you see that at the beginning, most times, programs will start with red. So in, what I would like you to take from this first graph is that the indicators usually uh, that we were using for these are sources of income, food security, what you are hearing about RIMA, meals, types, incomes, uh, diversity, healthcare, water treatment, savings. What we did see that was getting different is that in the second cohort, the results are, um, we are getting faster towards graduation than in the first cohort because we had definitely learned a few things. The other thing that you will see here in this slide is that we did a follow-up 18 months after the first cohort had graduated and we were checking, do they still meet the graduation criteria? So what we are kind of calling a resilience uh, follow-up. And 61% of them were still holding on to their graduation status, meaning they had still made it with majority being the Ugandan ones. And Ugandans generally have uh, a bit more land, a, a bit more social connections. Those kinds of things matter uh, for a person. But 61% resilience implemented in the middle of COVID, we think is epic and it should be celebrated. But there are some people who didn't meet the graduation criteria in the first cohort uh, because we go to 73%. And when we look at those characteristics, we are seeing not short people, no. You need to be, <laughs> you, the kinds of people who have a high dependency, the kinds of people that have chronic illnesses. So the same characteristics that we were seeing earlier on, the kinds of people that have less skills, the kinds of people that live, maybe they're a bit older and they don't have the right support mechanism. So those kinds of people don't really meet the criteria. And our recommendation is that a social assistance, a protection grant might be necessary for such people because they will not move into a graduation state. Oh, perfect. The RCT uh, that uh, IPA was doing, basically comparing these th three treatments, found that whether you received an asset or not, you are still better, of course, than the ones who didn't. But you, there was not much difference between the group or individual coaching. 
The only thing is that the group coaching was much cheaper, about 13% cheaper than uh, the individual coaching. So if you're thinking about scale, you want to go with that. Now, shocks. When we looked at the resilience data, we were asking what kind of shocks. And I know we've been seeing things like climate, uh, I don't know, uh, all kinds of shocks. For a family, usually the shocks are quite uh, connected to illness, injury, death, things that you might not change too much. You could try and improve somebody's health, but you might not control death. But you could do certain things. And 66% of them experienced a shock. About three or four shocks were experienced generally by every single family. What we did see also is that they were spending their savings. So the savings portfolio, which we've been seeing since morning, has been, it's always in the middle. It's, if you have to do anything else, keep the savings groups because they keep you with the, they protect, they, most people revert to that for their savings. And if we just go here, graduation programs tend to do much more than they should have done. So they will not, while you're reducing poverty, you're improving uh, uh, food security, you're improving nutrition, you're changing the narrative on GBV. Uh, and as you can see there, for some people in the program, it's about feeling loved or it's about being respected or becoming a leader. Uh, and the narrative goes on like that. While you think that you're actually improving somebody's income diversification, the real thing for them is, is something else. And I hope that we will be able to, to watch that. But just as I, I, I close this, um, we think what works to give you this shield to go on. If you have to design a program, do group coaching, definitely, because there's a lot of social cohesion around that. Work with a family, not an individual. Don't target a woman, target a family and figure out how family members will, will work in different aspects of these six different layers of activities. Don't think everybody's the same. If you're working with refugees, do a 50-50 because there's a cohesion that comes with that. Digitalize. If you can get a phone, send a message, coach through, whatever you try to use a, a, a digital equipment because it, it's cheaper, it's faster. Market systems around matter. We did something called social contracts where you'd sign up something and agree with the family on how you'd proceed. Consider certain uh, ratios like one to, like the, the coaching ratio we, we had was one to a hundred. Livestock is important. You need to think about an optimum period. And lastly, if you're thinking about scale, usually economic inclusion programs, are, uh, everybody wants to say they're expensive without thinking about the return on investment, how long it takes. But just to break it down, if you're spending $1,500 on an extremely poor household in the next uh, 24 months, it means you're spending $2 per day for 24 months, or you're spending $62 per week or per month for a single household. What you will get is about 85% graduation rates, and what you'll get later is about 70% resilience rates. So why not spend upfront? instead of spending every day buying a jerry can and doing humanitarian assistance, knowing that the shock is there. And if you're thinking about scale, there are ways in which you could try to reduce certain costs, work with the market, know that there is a spillover possibility, measure resilience, uh, but also start thinking about doing coaching that is inclusive of psychosocial, of ECD. I know in the next session, we'll be looking at some of those examples. And uh, I hope I didn't stress you. <laughs> Not at all. You know, of the many things I love about what Rita presents, the, the uh, attention to cost, you know, it's never far from her thoughts because uh, uh, every good idea has a cost associated with it and we've got to be careful there. So um, thank you, Rita. Colin, I hope you're still here. Um, we're a little bit short on time, so what I think we can do, Sophie, if you don't mind, if we can take uh, two or three quick questions and then give uh, um, Rita and Colin the mic uh, just to respond as they would, and we'll uh, finish up that way. Thanks. Thank you very much, both. Uh, greatly appreciated. I have a question for each. Uh, to Andrew. To Andrew first. Um, you've mentioned an, a great array of financial mechanisms to different area of 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 the globe so i'm not sure you can see us but uh, uh, how flexible are, are those financing mechanisms and how robust they are they to uh, to the 
ongoing poly crisis or payment crisis. Um, and secondly, in terms of the displacement, I'd very much be interested to know how different is it from humanitarian assistance and 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 what type of uh, uh, um, uh, financial mechanism or activities we're talking about or program rather we're talking are we talking about in terms of displacement. For Rita, thank you so much. That was uh, great to hear from uh, from you. Um, you you. I know we use the word resilience a lot, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm not a purist, but I, I, I'm wondering, do we need to redefine resilience now? Because if uh, by month 24, you said we achieve resilience, maybe we need to work around our definition, internal definition of resilience uh, and, and fit what would actually, the, the purpose of, of, of EDGE program. And, and I'm not familiar with graduation, although I've heard a lot about it, but what is the threshold for graduation? Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for the brilliant presentation and the panel discussion. Um, I'm Kunal Parekh from Community Action Collab. <clears throat> and um, in India, uh, during COVID times, um, one of the private university has reported 230 million people fell below poverty line, which is pegged at $2 per day. And, um, and I'm still wondering how, um, you know, with all, the, with all the discussion on economic inclusion that we've had, even before COVID, the programming, the way it was done, whether it was for health or livelihood, did not factor the stressors. And hence, the SROI is going to be constantly getting impacted. I, I don't know, is there any policy change? Is there a provision to estimate the possibility, uh, probability of a stressor like that and uh, you know, be factored in the SROI calculation? That is actually just a request, Andrew. This is Greg Collins. You, you get a great presentation, got to the evidence slide, and then quickly skipped past it. So just in the background, if you can put the evidence slide up for the evidence forum, we'd love it. And let's go to Rita first to respond to any or all questions uh, quickly, and then Colin. I, th I think the question was about the threshold, the, the one that I should be dealing with. So yes, that's a, that's a good question. And I think the threshold is stretched in whichever direction somebody would like to stretch it and how they feel. But I think what I've learned uh, in the last few days and I've been thinking a bit about it is that we need to start thinking about resilience locally, like sort of get some local constructs. I know that we have found our way towards poverty and we know that if you're dollar one ninety five below, then you're poor. And that we also know that there are certain characteristics that will make you less resilient or more resilient. We know that there are certain tools that are used for resilience. Some are huge, others are little. So what we did with this graduation uh, criteria was basically to understand from the, the, the community, what is it that makes you poor, extremely poor? How would you rank a poor person? And they characterize this poverty. Once they did that characterization, it was those usual things. You don't go to school, you're in debt, uh, you don't eat well, you're not feeling well, your housing is terrible. So once they, they characterized those kinds of things, they became the graduation criteria. And you needed to meet. Uh, so w w what we did was combine what they were saying in the community with what we were uh, providing in a, a scorecard sort of tool. And eventually we got to a place where what we had in the tool and what the community was saying was matching. And so we now have a tool. But we don't recommend anybody to carry that tool and run along with it to Malawi. What we would recommend is that you use the exact same experience to define uh, a threshold for that location and then use that to run along with it. We use it again, yes, as a resilience follow-up tool over time. And we think if you can continue to meet this, then you're resilient. We've compared it with several other tools, SRI, and we think it gets towards RIMA. It's very close. The indicators are very similar, but still, I think, contextualize. Thank you. Colin, and thanks for uh, showing the slide again. Yeah, sorry, yes. sorry we have to run through my slide deck while you were speaking. Uh, I, I, I think I got the two questions. Uh, for me, um, just on the forced displacement agenda, 
Um, so recently, over the last couple of months, <clears throat> the uh, the World Development Report uh, had focused on labour mobility and migration, um, a big area of emphasis. I think that we're seeing with a lot of our own clients um, on that broad spectrum of interventions, the forcibly displaced uh, narrative uh, is uh, came across very strongly in our programs, and I think we had identified close to a hundred different type of interventions um, being taken out and a lot of discussion there that Rita already previewed around the linkages between uh, host communities and uh, between um, uh, the uh, refugees as well and, uh, and the program design implementations. The, the couple of other questions that I had, I think, were, uh, I didn't catch the first question, my apologies, um, but I'll use the floor maybe to come back to what I think might be the answer. Um, around the evidence slide. So the evidence slide is is, 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 is here. Uh, I think building on Rita's intervention, one of the big stressors that I would leave you with is to say, look, we do have a, a huge amount of evidence, uh, sometimes a little bit contradictory uh, in terms of what we might be seeing overall, very strong uh, signs in, in, in terms of the uh, returns and investments, in terms of what the, uh, the uh, these interventions can do for coping capacities. Uh, where our big emphasis at the moment right now is uh, looking at a number of programs. We have about 20 programs on our radar, building up in government systems, all handling these questions of financing and costs uh, to understand how they can be more effective, to, how, to understand how they can be more optimal. A great deal of experience coming out from the Sahel region, particularly around the role of cash transfers in this regard. Uh, so we will be looking very closely at uh, a number of these programs to understand what evidence is coming down the track, but also supporting uh, our country uh, government partners at the same time in understanding evidence and, 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 and in understanding their real time program adaptations, depending on what's coming out of some of those um, of, of some of those evaluations. So not just waiting for an RCT uh, to tell us five years down the track, uh, what could have been and what should have been, but being able to adapt a little bit more in real time. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me and apologies if I couldn't be there in person. Be uh, a little bit different. Um, don't stand up yet, but uh, when I say go, uh, we're going to stand up and move to the next room where there are three stations. And we have um, Sam, Brad, and Tim, and they're uh, talking about their three um, themes uh, that I uh, introduced earlier. Um, how much time do we have? 10 minutes per group? Yeah. Is that it? Uh, we started late. I'm not sure. Uh... Well, anyway, uh, presenters, try to uh, share some ideas and get some discussion and Q&A going within 10 minutes. We're then going to rotate to the next station and then to the third station so you get exposed to all three of these important themes. And then if you would come back here for just a very quick closing. So uh, now you can stand up, go to the next room and find a uh, screen. Thank you. Thank you.